This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. Many think fission has gotten a bad rap, but modern reactor designs and the demand for clean power may redeem what was once thought to be an energy panacea. So today we'll be talking about the future of nuclear fission, and looking at everything from new reactor designs to applications in space and in other areas like medicine and agriculture, and even portable devices. As a quick side note, today marks the 6th anniversary of our very first episode, Megastructures in Space, and we'll commemorate that briefly at the end of the episode, and it's appropriate for our topic today as power and energy production are so vital to our grand dreams for the future, and as we'll see today, fission is likely to play an enormous role in taking us into that future, especially for the spacecraft that will actually take us there. The elephant in the room for nuclear power is always the concerns about safety, and I tend to think a fair amount of that is simply from nuclear power and radiation being a bit mysterious. I don't want to dwell too much on the safety concerns or particle physics today, but we will spend some time on them before getting into the various reactor designs and future uses, and we'll start with the basics of fission and fusion. In nature, atoms tend to fall into two categories, those that were around from the beginning, mostly hydrogen and helium, and those made by stars. However, it is inaccurate to think most elements are made by giant stars exploding. Things like gold, platinum, and uranium are made when two neutron stars collide, long after the two supernovae that made each of those neutron stars. They are not made by the classic process of fusion where lighter elements merge to form heavier ones and release a net positive energy. Protons and neutrons, called nucleons because they are what appear in atomic nuclei, are made up of three quarks, but those quarks don't actually have much mass themselves. We explained it in greater detail on our episode on antimatter, but most of the mass of nucleons are composed of the particles that glue them together, the mediating particle of the strong nuclear force, aptly named the gluon. When you jam or fuse nucleons together with some glue, it takes less of it per particle the more particles you jam together, until you get to about 60. As you fuse them together, some of those excess gluons become available as energy. This is nuclear fusion, and we discussed it in detail in our Fusion Power episode. This peaks out with iron and iron-56, its most common isotope composed of 56 nucleons, 26 protons, and 30 neutrons, and is the atom with the lowest binding energy and thus the end of profitable fusion processes and also why iron is pretty common in the Universe. Atomic nuclei more massive than iron start to take more energy per particle to jam the stuff together, which is why a pair of neutron stars, already very jammed together, can collide and spew out tons of heavier elements. While many elements past iron are called stable, meaning they have no known half-life, the bigger you get the more glue it takes to cram things together, and many isotopes have an unstable arrangement which will reshuffle to a more stable state, often through emitting a particle and often going through a number of semi-stable states along the way. We call this nuclear decay, and the period of time in which half a given type of atomic isotope will do it, on average, is the half-life. Think of it as akin to a heap of material where something occasionally shifts or breaks and it settles into a more stable heap, emitting a loud noise, in this case a particle of radiation. Fission includes both nuclear reactions and technically passive radioactive decay, but usually just means splitting atoms not atomic decay, and we discussed the value of rapidly decaying elements as a power source in our episode Portable Power, and the various isotopes with quick decay times hold the potential to be awesome mobile power sources and safe ones too. It is their scarcity rather than their radioactivity that is the problem with using them in common devices like telephones and laptops. We will discuss how to create those elements today though. Fission by nuclear reaction, which we will just call fission for the rest of the episode, usually involves smacking an atomic nucleus with something to split it up. In the case of uranium-235, if a slow-moving neutron, only moving a couple kilometers per second, happens by, it will break that uranium-235 into barium-141 and krypton-92. 92 plus 141 is 233, and the uranium-235 plus the neutron was 236 nucleons, so you also get three extra neutrons, each wandering off on its own way. Only the neutrons are moving quite fast in this case, typically a few percent of light speed. If we slow them down a lot, from about 20,000 kilometers per second to just 2 kilometers per second, then they'd be moving slow enough that if they ran to another uranium-235 nucleus, they'd cause it to break and spit out three more neutrons, which can then break another nuclei. This is a fissile chain reaction, and can actually happen in nature but not so much nowadays because there isn't much uranium-235 left. 
The event that made the uranium here on Earth, the collision of two neutron stars, presumably produced about the same amount of the various isotopes of any given element. Uranium has six isotopes, 232, 233, 234, 235, 236, and 238. 238 has the longest half-life, 4.5 billion years, so about half of whatever was on Earth when the planet formed is still around, while the next longest lived, 235, with a 700 million year half-life, is down to only about 0.72% of what is found in nature, and uranium-234, half-life a quarter of a million years, is only about 0.005%. Which can be a little misleading too, 0.005% might not sound like much but it's way more than you have left from 4.5 billion years of decay with a quarter million year half-life. That's 18,000 half-lives and you'd only have one in 2 to the 18,000 of the original particles left. Even after just 100 half-lives your odds of finding a single particle of a substance left undecayed, in a handful sized sample, are about your odds of winning the lottery and there are not enough particles of anything in the entire Universe that you expect to find even one undecayed particle of it 18,000 half-lives later even if every atom of the Universe were originally made of it. Rather, when uranium-238 decays, which is pretty rare with a half-life as old as our planet, It decays into thorium-234, emitting what's called an alpha particle, two protons and two neutrons, which is basically a helium ion without an electron shell. Thorium-234 has a very short half-life, just 24.1 days, and it beta decays, beta radiation being when a nucleus emits an electron or its antimatter twin, the positron. The thorium-234 then turns into protactinium-234, Same thing but one more proton and one less neutron, and it spits out an electron. This is even more unstable and will beta decay again, spitting out another electron as it gains a proton and loses a neutron, and becomes uranium-234. For every uranium-238 atom on Earth now, there's about an equal number of them that decay down this chain into uranium-234, but since uranium-234 is only about an 18,000th as long lived as uranium-238, only about an 18,000th of natural uranium is 234. 234 decays into thorium-230 incidentally and all isotopes of uranium, no matter how long lived, decay via alpha particle emission to a thorium isotope with four fewer nucleons and an atomic mass that is lower by approximately four. It's just in uranium-238's case it does it twice, dropping to thorium-234 then eventually down to thorium-230 after a rest stop as uranium-234. This episode, again, is not about passive decay, but finding short-lived isotopes in quantities on Earth after hundreds or thousands of half-lives indicates there is a natural process making them not requiring neutron stars to collide, which can be a big clue for making them in the lab and fairly efficiently. We often do this with a breeder reactor and it's how we make plutonium, by letting uranium-238 absorb a neutron and emit two electrons and thus turn into plutonium-239. It's easier for uranium-238 to absorb fast neutrons than for uranium-235 to absorb them, and there's a lot more uranium-238 in a natural sample. So to create a good sustaining fission reaction, where at least one of the three neutrons spat out by the uranium-235 during fission gets absorbed by another U-235 atom to sustain the process, we either need to cut down on the uranium-238 in our sample or slow those neutrons down more so they interact more easily with the U-235, or in practice both. Uranium enrichment, separating natural uranium into its isotopes, typically produces enriched uranium and depleted uranium, the latter having half or more of its U-235 removed and leaving it a higher concentration of U-238. Enriched uranium has a lot more U-235 in it, low enriched would be anything under 20% U-235, which is still a lot from 0.72% found in nature, while weapons grade is usually 85% or higher. Most reactor designs today use low enriched uranium or even unenriched uranium in the case of the CANDU reactor, but many advanced designs are based around a middle ground called high assay low enriched uranium, which is about 20% U-235. Slowing neutrons is the job of what we call the moderator, and the two most popular kinds are water and graphite, though many things can slow a neutron. You don't want to absorb the neutrons though, just slow them down, and water will often absorb them whereas heavy water, water where the hydrogen in the H2O is actually deuterium, a proton and a neutron instead of just a proton, is better at not absorbing neutrons. So your basic nuclear reactor, using uranium, has enriched uranium clumps, be it rods or pebbles, separated by some moderator, and as some neutrons come out from a fission event they meander through that moderator slowing down, till they reach another clump of uranium and cause a fission event. 
If you set your moderator just right you get a 1 to 1 ratio, a stable fission event that keeps going until you run out of fuel, or rather get lower on it since less fission events are happening. This is not a naturally stable process, going exactly 1 to 1 like that, and you can tweak the reaction rate by playing with the moderator's density. Regular water with no deuterium, called light water in this context, acts as a slightly worse moderator when its temperature raises, so helps keep the reaction stable. We also have control rods, which are materials that just absorb neutrons well and can be lowered down between the chunks of uranium to suppress the reaction. When all goes well you can keep the reaction at 1 to 1, and throttle the actual rate up or down to produce more or less power. Power production itself is pretty mundane, all those fission fragments and neutrons have a ton of kinetic energy, again they are moving at a few percent of light speed when they leave the original atom that underwent fission, and that kinetic energy smacking around the core produces a lot of heat. For water as a moderator, we usually just use it as a coolant too, though some reactors will use gases or liquid metal or molten salt for cooling. Regardless of whether the coolant and moderator are the same thing or not, the coolant is what drives power production. We generally like to run the reactor as hot as safe without melting stuff, because you get a better power production efficiency when dropping from a higher temperature to a lower one. This all runs through the cooling towers of the plant, though the mass of steam and clouds coming off those cooling towers is not the stuff that was running through the core, but rather on the other side of a closed loop, cooling off the coolant as it were. That is the standard nuclear reactor most of us know, and most of them are light water reactors, again that's regular water, though heavy water isn't super rare. Pebble bed reactors used graphite as a moderator, as did the first reactors, the old atomic piles, which is also what we called reactors back in the day. And instead of rods of uranium in a moderator of water, it's pebbles of the fuel inside graphite, and we dump a bunch of them into a bed which we use gas to cool. These can run hotter and don't melt down, which is basically when the control rods get stuck and can't lower to quench the reaction, though they have their own limitations and modern reactor designs have many new features than classic reactors to help against meltdowns. One example is having the control rods being shoved down by a spring and pushed up by an electric motor, so that if anything happens to the motor, or the power supply in it, or you hit the off switch, it just drops the control rods. I don't want to pound on the safety angle too much, nuclear power is dangerous, though it has the fewest deaths and injuries per unit of power generation of any of our power generation methods, and we get better at the safety angle every day. Indeed much of the danger is from us using older reactors still, rather than building the new ones. Still it's got the best safety record of any form of power generation we've got, but all technology is dangerous and power generation of any type can be weaponized. The Kazinti lesson, that a spaceship's drive can be used as a weapon, popularized by writer Larry Niven and sometimes called John's Law from John W. Campbell's earlier version, reminds us of this, or as we say on this show, there is no such thing as an unarmed spaceship. So too, there is no such thing as unweaponizable power generation. Power is power, you can use it to blow stuff up, either just by running a munitions factory, to say nothing of powering an electromagnetic railgun. Whether or not nuclear fission will ever be our main source of power production depends a lot on how the economics work out, which are heavily controlled by regulations for good or ill, and how other technologies develop, like solar power and batteries for instance. Nuclear power is also one of our best options for space travel between planets, and we discussed using it for running spaceships in our episode, The Nuclear Option. However, if we do the fission route we have an effectively limitless supply of fuel for it, I have heard folks say we have this or that many numbers of centuries of fissile fuel left, but that's a killless figure. Uranium is disgustingly common, most is in the planet's core but it's about 2 parts per million in our crust, and you've got a bunch in your backyard and need a couple micrograms every day. And given that it produces a million times more energy than chemical sources, it is worth centrifuging out if you need it. Those stockpiles have to do with known supplies and existing high concentration ore deposits, and only discussed uranium-235, not thorium or other fertile materials produced by breeder reactors. It is a good deal lower in concentration in seawater too, but easily removed, and one handy application of nuclear power is desalinating drinking water, as you boil off a lot of water during power production that's basically free desalination. The nuclear power plant near me is jokingly called the Cloud Factory for a reason, I'm over 10 miles away and can still see the plume of water vapor rising off it from my backyard. That's one obvious application to agriculture, but we'll mention a few others in a bit when we get to breeder reactors. 
I mentioned alternate coolants and molten salts as one of them, and we hear a lot about molten salt these days for power storage. One of the upsides of molten salts is they do a very good job storing heat, but for reactors we contemplate them as a coolant or even the fuel itself, because they don't have to be under high pressure. In a light water reactor, to keep that water a liquid and not steam, we have to keep it at around 100 atmospheres of pressure. The boiling point of most liquids rises when you put it under pressure and lowers when you decrease it, and most steam driven power production uses high pressure to keep the water a liquid at high temperatures, as that gets you more efficient power production. Molten salt lets you run things even hotter, but it also lets you go smaller, as you don't need a massive containment vessel for keeping water a hundred times more pressurized than it normally is on Earth. A molten salt reactor, or MSR, has the potential to let you make smaller reactors, which is nice because normally nuclear power plants are huge affairs for putting out thousands of megawatts of power and running a million homes. Smaller ones are attractive for more remote locations and to avoid transmission losses. About 50% of electricity is lost as waste heat in power lines, something we discussed limiting with superconductors if we ever get room temperature ones, as we looked at recently in the impact of superconductors. With those, the big efficient plants become more attractive, as you can stick your power plant far from anyone else, out in the middle of a desert or tundra, and not lose any power sending it to where the folks live. Without that, smaller reactors are more attractive, and that includes another type, the Small Modular Reactor or SMR. Multiple types of reactors have been suggested for SMR usage, but the critical concept is essentially one small enough to be moved, either in total or as completed modules bolted together at the power plant, and which are better at containment and passive safety features. The basic notion is to make a small black box reactor, potentially small enough to be loaded on a truck or train, that requires no real maintenance or construction at its site, and which can be picked up after their lifetime and disposed of after processing unspent fuel. These SMRs are made in a factory, with quality controls and production efficiencies that site-built, one-off plants don't have. Incidentally, this is an example of a Generation 4 reactor, Generation 1 being the old atomic piles and Generation 2 most of the ones you see, with Generation 3 including examples like the ABWR or Advanced Boiling Water Reactor. I don't want to get in the weeds on that as the differences in many reactor types are basically how you cool the thing and how you generate power off the coolant. Some Generation 4 reactors go for a different concept, called a Fast Neutron Reactor or FNRs. We've mostly discussed Thermal Neutron Reactors thus far, where we slow the neutrons down to the average speed of other particles in the reactor, the thermal velocity of those particles. Fast neutron reactions don't use a moderator, and as you might guess, don't rely on having as much uranium-235 as a thermal reactor. They can instead, for instance, rely on uranium-238, the type of uranium that's way more common and much better at absorbing fast neutrons. The product of that, of U-238 absorbing a neutron, is a plutonium atom. And this is where we get to breeder reactors, which FNRs can do too, not just power generation. A breeder reactor is one that's using the fission chain reaction process to make some other material, plutonium being the big one. Plutonium-239 is much better for making atomic bombs, and while it's no more sensitive to fast neutrons than U-235, you can sustain a reaction on either if you just have enough at present and the absence of other things, essentially if it's very enriched. This lets you remove the moderator from the equation and makes a smaller and in some ways simpler reactor. If we compress plutonium down really densely, by an implosion for instance, then the neutrons emitted by fission are likely to be absorbed by their neighbors, which is how atom bombs work. The other route is just to have a lot of it there, and not much else, though you can wrap your plutonium in U-238 to capture the neutrons that do escape and breed more plutonium for later separation and usage. This is not limited to plutonium incidentally, one of the more interesting options is americium, which we don't find in nature and most of its isotopes have quite short half-lives with americium-243 being the longest lived at 7,370 years, followed by americium-241 at 432 years, and that half-life makes it very interesting as a possible power supply by passive decay. Useful passive decay power generators can really only come from breeder reactors since they don't occur in nature in useful quantities, again due to that short half-life. One type of americium, 241M, also acquires the least amount of fissile material to sustain a chain reaction of any type that we know of. If you really want to go small with a fission reactor or nuclear battery, this is the way to do it. 
But probably the most interesting breeder reactor option, or at least the most discussed in recent years, is thorium. As I mentioned earlier, all isotopes of uranium eventually decay into thorium, and it's pretty common by itself anyway, but thorium-232 is what's known as a fertile material, which means if we whack it with neutrons it does not undergo fission, but rather turns into something which does, namely uranium-233 after a brief stopover as thorium-233, with its brief half-life of 22 minutes, followed by a time as protactinium-233 as it pops out an electron and swaps a neutron into a proton. This lasts a little longer, with a 27-day half-life before beta decaying into uranium-233. Uranium-233 is fissile, so we can generate power from it or leave it in to help breed more of itself or potentially do both at once. This is the big interest in thorium as a power source, essentially as a source of uranium-233, and thorium is more plentiful than uranium-2. Now, the potential for thorium does tend to get a little overhyped. It is a great alternative to uranium, but usually folks are comparing it against old Generation 2 reactors, not the newer uranium reactor designs, which is a bit unfair. It's often cited as being better for avoiding nuclear proliferation, but that's a debatable point. Regardless, I generally warn folks off this notion, same as ideas like strictly defensive weaponry, there is no such thing as a power source you can't weaponize, or a defensive weapon you can't use for offense. You can tinker with a reactor, and uranium-233 can be made into atomic bombs, and indeed, unlike plutonium, it can be used in the gun-type nuke, the easiest one to build. Also, even ignoring the ways you can make electricity into a weapon, e.g. railguns and lasers, the simple possession of energy abundance is weaponizable, running your weapons factories and all the bits of your society that build the components for those, not to mention raising your GDP from cheap energy, allowing you to build more guns. This isn't to say you shouldn't be worried about folks having potential access to weapons-grade material, but thorium's big benefit isn't that it's super safe from folks getting nukes or magically super efficient and safe reactors. Nuclear is dangerous. All technology is. Heck, the rare earth minerals so prized for solar and wind, and so many of our electronics, contain uranium and thorium. We process it out and the mine tailings are very rich in them as a result. This is a huge part of why we don't get so much rare earth production in most countries, as rare earths aren't even vaguely rare, but they produce a lot of thorium and a lot of mines shut down because of thorium discharges in the tailings, and cleanup or prevention of that isn't cheap, unless of course you don't care. On the other hand, if you've got a proper use for thorium, that isn't such an issue anymore when your waste becomes a fuel. I don't want to minimize the value of thorium as a reactor fuel either, It has a lot of potential, especially for expanding fissile stockpiles, but it's not an across-the-board better alternative to uranium. As time goes on we're seeing other improvements too, heat pipes for instance. The ability to move heat efficiently is very important for any heat engine, but it is great for nuclear reactors which need lots of cooling, and where the primary coolant usually has to be kept in a closed loop and heat piped into another medium, resulting in various issues and efficiency losses. Heat pipe reactors take this a bit further, using heat pipes to move power from the core directly to the power conversion system. Nuclear power isn't just useful for electricity generation though, a huge number of other fields use products from nuclear power, including a few you might not think of. Perhaps the best known is in medicine. Pretty much every chemotherapy drug used in cancer treatment was produced in a nuclear reactor, where the neutrons are absorbed by a precursor material which is kept in a special container in the core until it transmutes into the correct isotope to use. High contrast MRIs and CAT scans also use radioactive material produced in nuclear reactors. Radiation imaging, including x-rays and neutron tomography, use either radioisotopes or sometimes even a dedicated facility next to a nuclear reactor to produce EM waves or particle beams to provide incredibly detailed images of not just internal injuries, but the functioning of various organs and processes within the body. New types of surgery, such as gamma knife surgery, offer faster healing surgical options, which are much more precise and sometimes an external incision isn't even needed, making healing even faster. Agriculture is another area that has benefited from nuclear power as well. From the first experiments in the 1950s and 1960s, using radiation to force mutations in crops, which were then selected for desired traits like bigger fruit or more drought resistance, to tracking nutrient flows in fields and water cycles, using mildly radioactive isotopes dissolved in water or fertilizer to pest control using radiologically sterilized pest insects as decoys to prevent infestations from growing out of control, 
a lot of modern agriculture is intrinsically tied to the nuclear industry. Other options include using a nuclear reactor not for its electricity generation but for the heat that comes off the core. Many big cities like New York City have district heating, which is a utility kind of like gas or electricity. With a nuclear reactor, you can not only provide district heating but also heat the roads and sidewalks in the winter months to prevent ice and snow from sticking, a huge safety bonus that would also save cities a lot of money. In reactors that operate at even higher temperatures, like gas-cooled reactors, you can even get the temperatures high enough to use in industrial processes, like chemical manufacturing, metallurgy and foundry production, and other energy-intensive processes. An SMR in a large factory could cover all its power and heat requirements for a very low cost. Finally, perhaps one of the biggest potential uses for nuclear reactors is in water desalination and carbon capture. Both of these are notoriously power-hungry processes, which means that they're expensive and not done unless there's no other choice, but both could be done at the same time with a nuclear reactor. The seawater would be drawn into a separate loop from the cooling loop, run through a chemical process to extract the CO2, and turn it into hydrocarbons, which is far easier to store and even use, and then be boiled to purify the water. Of course you can't just dump the salt back into the sea without causing an ecological nightmare, but there's ways to dispose of it safely. Lastly, we should discuss radioactive waste and its disposal and recycling. There are a few different types of nuclear waste, low-level waste, intermediate-level waste, and high-level waste. Low-level waste is often very weakly radioactive, sometimes it's even just someone's shoes if they forgot to switch those little paper booties at the plant, but it is stored out of an abundance of caution. This is the most common type of nuclear waste, and usually puts off less radiation than you would get standing in the sun for a few minutes. This comprises 90% of the volume of all radioactive waste, but only puts out 1% of the radiation of all types of waste combined. Intermediate level waste is a huge range of waste types, radioactive but not enough to generate a lot of heat. This includes chemicals used in radioisotope refining, some parts of decommissioned nuclear reactors, and even the protective metal clad used on the fuel elements in reactors. It makes up about 7% of the volume of nuclear waste and accounts for only about 4% of the radiation. Finally we come to the high level radioactive wastes. This is stuff like used nuclear fuel and byproducts from reprocessing, as well as some chemicals and equipment used in weapons production and some portions of decommissioned reactors. This stuff is so radioactive that not only does it need to be shielded, but it's putting out over 2 kilowatts per cubic meter of heat, something that facilities have to be designed around. Much of this radioactivity comes from transuranic elements produced in the reactors, but there are designs for fast neutron reactors that can burn this fuel and reduce the time it's dangerously radioactive. Other types such as strontium-90 are useful as either RTG fuel or as a radiation source for various sensors and equipment. So depending on how much you're willing to put into your reprocessing facility, you can get far more than just fuel out of high level waste. Reprocessing or recycling of spent nuclear fuel is a complicated process, and one that most countries don't do in civilian power production simply because it's too expensive. New uranium fuel is cheap, in fact it's the cheapest thing about operating a nuclear power plant, so reprocessing is not really necessary today. The classic way, called the Purex process, is to grind up your fuel and soak it in nitric acid to dissolve the uranium and plutonium. This process produces a fair bit of low to intermediate level waste in the form of a radioactive acidic slurry, but it is well understood and is done in France, who also reprocesses fuel for most of Europe, Russia, and Japan. The UK also used to have a facility, Sellafield, but it was closed after repeated accidents. The next option, called pyroprocessing, which replaces the nitric acid with a molten salt mixture, which is then passed through various chemical synthesis steps to remove the fuel and high level actinides. This salt can be reused far more than nitric acid, and promises to be more efficient than the Purex process, but has only ever been done on small scales. The last major option for reprocessing is called Silex and uses powerful laser beams to deflect a stream of individual ions of mixed isotopes into different collectors. This was developed in Australia about a decade ago and shortly after it was released it was also classified, so details are scarce. It's hard to tell if this will be more economical, but using giant lasers to separate nuclear fuel is a cool option. All nuclear waste needs to be stored for 5 half-lives or so, at which point it's no more radioactive than the environment. How long that is depends on the isotopes involved and if their decay results in something chemically toxic. Europe and Russia reprocess their spent fuel, and the resulting high-level waste is chemically bound in an inert material. France uses glass for this, 
There isn't much of it either, all of it easily fits into one single football field sized chamber. In the US the entire fuel structure is kept in a pool until it cools down to the point it can be stored in giant armored concrete cylinders known as dry casks, usually placed next to the reactor that used the fuel. Geological storage repositories for spent nuclear fuel in the US have failed for political reasons although Finland is getting close to completing one in the next few years. Overall disposal and recycling of waste materials shouldn't represent a serious problem to increasing nuclear power, especially using the improved techniques mentioned. Needless to say though, there is a big difference between what science and engineering says is safe and the population's comfort level with it. So the future of fission, if we get it cheaper and safer and more palatable to the public, is not a guaranteed thing on Earth. If you can produce solar panels and power storage cheaply enough, then nuclear power loses some of its value. But if you can do the former but not the latter, nuclear becomes a great nighttime or bad weather power source too, and the newer designs can crank the power up or down in mere minutes, making them a good backup power supply or power supplement. And of course if someone gets fusion working it might become mostly redundant, but would still have some handy applications. On Earth anyway. Up in space atomic power, either by itself or in tandem with solar, is very promising, and again we explore that more in our episode, The Nuclear Option. Fundamentally though, the big challenge is changing hearts and minds on nuclear, and if we can do so, we have an excellent power source that can give us cheap, ecological, safe, and long-lasting energy. So as I mentioned at the start of the episode, today is the 6th anniversary of our very first episode, Megastructures in Space, and what I usually call Episode 0 as it was the only episode we did in 2014, and indeed our weekly shows did not start until February of 2016, a year and a half later, appropriately with our episode Megastructures Shell Worlds. And I thought we'd take some time to look back over the last 6 years, but before we get to that, I wanted to thank our longtime sponsor Brilliant who has been helping support the show for years now, and whose online interactive courses make a great complement to the material we discuss on the show. What I aim to do here is to educate and entertain, but to truly master the concepts you've got to work with them, and Brilliant is an excellent place to do that. They make a great addition to the videos like these, as they let you get hands-on learning and practice with the concepts to help you truly master them, and learn more about how our world and our universe work. From courses and quizzes, to a community forum to get help, to daily challenges and an offline app that let you sharpen your analytical abilities anywhere you are and have a few minutes to spend, Brilliant lets you learn math, science, and computer science, and have fun while you're doing it. If you want to learn more and help support our show, you can try Brilliant out for free by going to brilliant.org slash IsaacArthur. In the 6 years of doing this show, we've stuck mostly to the same core format, me talking while video and clips played, and we will mostly be keeping to that, but I thought I'd show up on camera for a change. Contrary to popular belief though, and the jokes about the show actually being run by an AI with a synthesized voice, I did actually have photos of myself up on screen occasionally, as far back as that second episode. I just didn't happen to own a camcorder or a webcam until shortly before we started doing the live streams, 2 years back. Plus, I've always liked to keep the focus on the content and not myself. For anyone who wants to take a trip down memory lane to watch some of those older episodes after this, you probably remember when I used to put that Elmer Fudd graphic up for my speech impediment, and for the first few years I was always on the fence as to whether or not to hire a narrator if the show ever got big enough to afford one. Amusingly, when I finally did get talked into accepting donations for the show, and said that one of the things we were raising funds for was a narrator, so much the audience was horrified by the notion that I actually scrubbed the idea in favor of just getting speech therapy, which has been going on now for around 3 years. Needless to say, it's been quite an interesting 6 years for me personally, including getting married this year, and I love what I do and plan to be doing it for at least another 6 years. Over those years, we've covered so many topics and have over 300 episodes, including all the bonus episodes and live streams, but amazingly we still have no end of topics to cover. I guess that's the neat thing about the future, there's just so much of it. However, I thought we'd also commemorate the occasion by having another episode topic poll over on our community tab. Speaking of that community, and of taking donations, I did want to thank all the folks who have donated to us on Patreon and by other methods down the years. 
And if you would like to help support the show, you can do that on Patreon or on our website, IsaacArthur.net. I will shamelessly throw in there that this weekend is my 40th birthday, too. As we head into our 7th year, we'll start it up next week by a return to the Fermi Paradox to contemplate how a scarcity of certain elements, like phosphorus, might make life and ancient alien civilizations a lot rarer than we otherwise might believe given the sheer immensity and age of our universe. Then we'll close out September with our monthly livestream Q&A on Sunday, September 30th, at 4pm Eastern Time, then we'll head into October for the third installment of our new series, Becoming an Interplanetary Species, as we look at heading back to the moon. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed the last 6 years of episodes, make sure to hit the like button. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.